Hey everybody, welcome back to another model building workshop. I'm Mr. Allen, I'm here at the Smith Hill Library here in Providence, Rhode Island, part of the Providence Community Library System. And we've been working on Airfix's 172nd scale P51D Mustang. This is of the famous Red Tails African American Squadron, the Tuskegee Airmen, World War II. The kit here. Paint guide on the back here with the infamous red tail. Okay, so we left off by getting the fuselage together. And if you watched the last episode, you would know that I had some issues getting the instrument panel in there correctly. It may have been my fault for the way I cut the panel off the uh, tree, plastic screw there. I uh, put the pilot in early, and I'm hoping this is all going to work out. Generally, the fits have been pretty good. Uh, I had an error. Well, so I tried to do a lot of the interior painting, and there were some areas I had to clean up a bit because of the paint. So we'll see how that all works out. So that's where that is right now. So, the next step is we're going to get on to the wings and the tailplane and those services. So, one thing, I guess we could call it an option, if we want the underwing tanks, which you can see in the picture here, them being dropped, the drop tanks, and uh, he's dropping his tanks because he's going to combat with the German Messerschmitt 109. You can see one here. So that was standard that they would fly out on these long-range missions and they would need the extra fuel tanks to help get them you know, well into Germany. So the Tuskegee Airmen, so this is the 100th Fighter Squadron. So th these were based in Ramatelli, Italy. Uh, this is part of Italy that had been liberated by the Americans uh, and the British. Uh, so it was based in Italy in December '44, and they were flying into the heart of Germany and then Austria and Hungary. So that's where they were escorting the American bomber formations that were bombing factories and targets deep inside uh, enemy territory. So they would need the extra fuel to be able to get those distances. So, and as soon as they would get into combat, they would drop the spare tanks because you wouldn't want, you know, the extra gas floating around because uh, that would be a rather explosive situation, quite literally, uh, if you took a bullet in one of those. So they do tend to, obviously, they would use the fuel in the fuel tanks first to get out and then return on their own internal gas tanks on the way back. Anyhow. I think that's kind of obvious, but <laughs> but anyhow. Uh, so in order to put those fuel tanks on the plane, it's it's an option. You don't have to do that. But they tell you in the instructions here that you're going to need to drill some holes in the plastic to do that. And this plane, as I can see by looking at this, I don't know if you can see this on the camera. It's hard to get these things to focus well. But there are other indentations in the plastic here in the wing. It looks like there's more uh, indentations for the rockets that would go on these planes for the Korean War era. They would have underwing rockets to attack ground targets. So it points out which holes you've got to drill out. So you use the point of an exacto blade to do that. Basically by drilling like this and then the hole comes through so I'm going to quickly try to use it and take very long to just because it's already it's already indented a bit All right, I have to push down a little more pressure on it and basically drill it okay yeah it's really quick when you get enough pressure. Oops. Okay. 
This one's giving me a little issues here. I mean, this isn't the most scientific method, and sometimes you make a hole that's bigger than you need to. But, I have more problems with this than I would like to. <laughs> it always happens as soon as you turn the camera on, you know, because <laughs> I did one already without much of an issue. Okay, so now we have the holes. If you can see them, but they're there. I take a chisel point and just clean up some of the extra plastic that, oops. All right, now it's a little smoother. Okay, so I'm gonna get these wings, the bottom and the top here. Hmm. Let's see what I can cut out with this. Of course, there's one attachment point on a rounded surface. I, I hate when they do that. Like this one. Gotta make it challenging. Let's see if the clippers will take that off. No, not a good angle to get in there. Grr. Not like there weren't enough straight parts to work with on this. I mean, it has a pretty straight wing. <laughs> right. That's, yeah, that's annoying because now I've got to carve this. I mean, it's not a major complaint, but that's something that could be so easily taken care of. Know why they had to put that there? So that's been my my biggest complaint with some of these new Airfix kits. Is it that not only are they really heavy attachment points you've got to cut off, but just the placement of where those points can be and the amount of cleanup required afterwards can be a pest. I mean, it's a price you pay, I guess, because the detail on these kits is really nice. They tend to go together pretty well, although that instrument panel and I didn't get along very well. Again, I don't know how much of that was me. Oh, but even so, it's still the issue of me trying to cut that panel off the plastic that caused the headaches. So it goes back to that same issue again. This doesn't look too bad. Some people have complained that the, they call the panel lines on these kits are, are a bit exaggerated. And I'll explain that in a second, so I'll clean this up. All right, so I don't know if you can see. There's these engravings in the wing to show you like the individual panels that, when it was assembled. There's little lines and boxes and shapes and forms on these pieces. So those engravings may be a, a little deeper than they need to be for scale. I tend to like the fact that they do it this way. It's a little heavy handed, but, but the detail shows up well. When you paint these, you can see these, these lines and features nicely, even if they are, they might be, like they said, exaggerated, but I think they look pretty, pretty good though. I don't have an issue with it, but it's just, it's interesting because some people in this hobby take every little detail very, very seriously for accuracy and so forth. And I get that, but there are times, you know, some things can get a little overblown, you know. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get this to let go. Again, a very heavy. Yeah, kerfunk. Wish they had thinned the plastic down at these connecting points. It makes it very difficult to cut these parts out. Anyway, 
stop complaining about it. <laughs> You're gonna get tired of hearing me talk about it, so. tip of the wing. I guess it left a pretty good chunk of plastic on here. And I don't want to take out on the corners here, the corners, yeah, pretty much the corner, the, the tip here. There's a little bump and that is for the uh, landing lights. With the red and green lights on the wing tips. If you ever watch a plane, flying overhead at nighttime, you'll, you'll see these directional lights will show up. So that gives you an idea of the direction the plane's going because the red and the green are on different sides of the plane. So that people and other aircraft will recognize the direction the plane is traveling in. Because sometimes at night you just see a vague outline of an airplane and some twinkling lights, but you can't necessarily figure out, is he coming toward me? Is he going away from me? But by having the red and green lights going, you can get a better sense. Now, most likely be deactivated during combat, <laughs> but if, but if you're well behind enemy lines, you might want to turn them off. Or when you're coming back home to friendly territory, you may want to activate them, depending. I do know a case, the German night fighter ace that was having a very successful night shooting down lots of allied aircraft. But when he was returning to base and refueling, when he took off, he left his, he left the landing light on too long. So when he took off, the light was still blaring and there were enemy planes circling this base waiting for an opportunity because it's pitch black. But they saw that light and they're like, ah, plane, and they just gunned him right down. Barely even got any altitude, they just gunned him right down because they had the lights on. Okay. It's a little, it's not fitting as well as I would like. I'm not sure why it isn't. Again, I had put some paint, this uh, cockpit green color that I got. So this is a model master color paint. So that's in here. And basically, those colors, those paint that they put inside the aircraft, the main reason for that is to help cut down on the rust. And also to make it a little bit, uh, easy for the pilot to be able to see things. But for the most part, it's going to be like an anti-rusting, anti-corrosive kind of a paint. And different Air Forces use different colors. A light green like this, this like apple colored green, tended to be the norm for a lot of countries. The Germans used a gray green, so did Italy did as well. 
Japan had two different colors. They had a, a light cockpit green, similar to this, maybe a little bit lighter than this color. But they also had a metallic blue that they used on some of them as well. The uh, Soviet Union and modern day Russia tend to use a metallic blue as well. It's kind of almost like a turquoise sort of aquamarine color. It's a bit garish, but I guess it does the job. Some nations use gray. I think this is ready to go in. I'm trying to think where that. All right. Try to beat around this. Get my model master glue. Again, as I said in other episodes, if you're working with kids, there is a child friendly glue that you can use as well. I'm a fan of this because it has the applicator. So as long as you keep that applicator clean, and they give you cleaning rods in the in the box when you buy these, so you can clean out any gunk that gets stuck in there. So yeah, I like the fact that you can draw a nice line. And it dries fairly quickly. It's one issue with the child-friendly glue is that it's slow, slow drying. Although it might be good for a kid because you get time to work with your pieces to make sure they, they lined up and they're drying where you want them to. So that does have that benefit. This fit could be a little bit better. It's not bad, but a slight gap. I would like that it to have been a little tighter, but it's pretty good. Yeah, this side's going to be intricate by the looks. These things really butt up against each other. room there. And I'm going to clean some of this cockpit green off the front of the wing tips. I get a little carried away with the green paint. Easy to scrape off. Again, I don't recommend using exacto blades with kids. <laughs> if you're a parent, you can use that, but I, I don't recommend kids use the knives until they're old enough to really get the handling of such a device down because the well, the, the blade I got here is getting kind of dull so it's probably not as much of a worry but a brand new sharp blade is pretty much a surgical tool <laughs> you know not liking how that's fitting there's a noticeable gap around this around the guns here I'm not sure why end. Man, that is not, not a particularly good fit. Well, that's disconcerting. All right. I don't know if you can see, but there's, yeah, you can see it. There's a noticeable gap in the front of the wing. So I think I may have to pause this for a minute and try to come up with a, a solution to clean that out. I don't think you want to sit and watch me file this thing for the next five minutes. So I'm just going to do a quick pause. I'm going to jump right back in as if nothing happened in just a second. So just wait a second. Ooh. And we're back. Uh, it's looking like after doing a lot of fiddling with this piece, I'm just going to have to glue it in there. 
And it might be a dab of putty that might have to fix this because I'm finding that seam to be extremely difficult. In fact, both sides, there's still one on the other side as well that's being annoying. So at the moment, I, I can't necessarily give this very high marks. I mean, there's a lot of things about this kit that are decent, but I'm finding things that are disappointing me. Um, That scene is pretty horrible. But that's what they make putty for, right? <laughs> Generally, I've been lucky. A lot of the kits I buy you don't even need the putty. They fit together pretty well. And, and including Airfix, I usually have good luck with them too. But today, you saw in the last video I ended up having to fight something then too so these are things to keep in mind if you were to buy this kit while well, I'm digging through this box box here's the child-friendly glue by testers so at the moment I'm just looking for oh, I got one it might be good. Oh, the other one. another very useful tool to have around for model building clothes pins because they can help you clamp things like that. Ugh. You know what? Let me try. Let me see if I put the fuselage on there, if that'll make this any better. Let's hope so. Oof. I'm already groaning and I haven't even. Oh, how is that supposed to go on? <laughs> uh. Wow, I don't have any idea how that's going to go. <laughs> That's gonna fight. All right. Well, this might be a fun lesson because, you know, we've been lucky with models that generally go together willingly. This one is going to be stubborn. So the more this one goes on, the more I'm starting to have issues with this kit. But it's also good that I'm trying this out because I think a kid would have thrown us against the wall already. And I can't say that I would blame him or her for doing so. Because I'm getting to the point where I, I might want to do the same thing. <laughs> Are we doing on time? All right. Just keeping an eye on that because I don't want to bore you guys forever and I'll have a meeting to do when this is done. So my day is only just starting. I want to spend this point with you guys before it happens. Okay. Let's wrestle with this some more. Other words come to mind, so we'll just go with wow. 
<laughs> and to be fair, you know, even great model companies will occasionally make something that doesn't work very well. I don't want to blame Airfix because they make so many great kits. And a lot of the stuff I built as a kid came from them. I have great memories of them. But once in a while, they get something that just doesn't quite work right. And that happens for pretty much everybody. Because I remember, not the one with bad mouth, some of the other model companies, but I remember building even Tamnio, which used to be the greatest model, some of the easiest ones to assemble. But I did try to build one of their Jeeps. I forgot which version, so don't. Uh, I think it was one of the Jeep, the Mutt. And I was trying to do that with kids, which I thought would work out. But yeah, some of that, I think that's part, part of the, the issue. That kit was a little too much for, uh, for a kid to do. I found that out the hard way. It was the Ford Mutt kit. It was a more modern, or 1980s version of the Jeep. But the, the drivetrain and some of that was a little daunting for a kid. And, and I had a bunch of them, so that was one of those classes. Although informative, because we all learned how, how to fix and how to deal with things that don't go well. And they all ended up becoming decent models in the end, but it was one of those lessons of frustration where we're fighting, like I am doing now, to try to make the kit work out. And perhaps it was more satisfying for the kids at the end that, hey, we made this thing work when it really didn't want to. Um, and we've had a number of other oddball kits. Um, one of the things that happens with a model building program like, like this at the library, since we're you know, a nonprofit, is that we rely pretty heavily on donations and model clubs have really helped us out in giving us, ah, here it goes, now it's popping up. Okay, this is gonna work. Not nearly as well as I would like. It's gonna require lots of putty which is an evil word to me, but as you can see there's a noticeable gap there. Uh, but I think I can put that thing in and go from there. I don't think there's anything else I can do before I get to that stage. Yeah, there's a couple other parts I can try to put together. Yeah, not too much. All right, I may have to cut the video short at this point. I may not glue this right now because I want to make sure I have all the clamps and everything set to fit that in. At the moment, uh, this kit's, but I'm showing you the problems as we're going. So learning my way through it and hopefully if you get one of these, at least you're prepared and you would know what to do. I do see the rudder I can put on. I do like the fact that they do these pieces separately. So if you wanted to angle these and put them in different flying positions, you can. I think that's a, a nice feature. And they have two positions for the flaps. You can have them down or you can have them in flight mode, you know. So there's, there's a few different ways you can go with that. See that, that rudder? fits in really nice. I'll take these wings off. This I'll work on later. So let me get the rudder in. And they have a nice curved indentation here. So you can make the rudder sit right in there. I'm not going to do anything fancy with it. I just want to get it level. When that's all painted red, that's going to look really nice. Painting has me a little bit concerned because this does not. Uh, just getting that sharp line from the back here. You know, probably put a piece of masking tape, you know, to kind of get the angle and get the tail painted. And there's a decal that has to go around the front, which. To be honest, that I'm kind of curious how that's going to work out to get this angled. 
decal on. I'm almost wondering if I should try to paint that. I don't know yet. So we'll see. So I'm thinking of using a Tamiya uh, natural bare metal spray paint to do this. I mean, they did give you the paints in the box if you want to do this by hand, which is a good option as well. But I'm thinking about doing a, a spray for the silver and then going from there with the other colors. Don't know yet. We'll see when I get there. Because first of all, i got to make sure this part fits in. Okay, so that's the lesson for today. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Uh, I know we ran a little longer than I would have intended because we did run into some issues, but we're working our way through them. And it's kind of good to know this before you go ahead and start one of these kits. At least you know what to look for. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. And be sure to check out other videos on the Providence Community Library YouTube channel. See you soon.